out this morning. Good morning, great morning, you know. Got up out of bed and excited to come to church. And got here and everything was going fine. And then all of a sudden things just quit going fine. You know, couldn't get the technology to work the way it's supposed to. We was having trouble getting the songs. Picked out two or three different songs and we ended up not singing. You know, you just, you know how it gets, you know, it just, everything starts to be a snowball today. Well, you know, I was getting really frustrated and really aggravated. And I walked to the back, and out of nowhere, I mean, Nick hadn't even been in here. He just comes walking through by the time I'm walking back. Nick comes walking through, walks up right beside of me, puts his arm around me. He says, I can't remember exactly the way he said it, but basically he said, I love you. <laughs> we talk about changing an attitude. Talk about touching your heart. That's what Jesus did for us. Amen. He can take that hard heart we have. He can take our worries, our struggles, the problems that we have. He can take those if we will give them to them. Communion time is a time that you have to talk to God, to thank Him, to thank God for sending His one and only Son to die for you. You can thank Jesus for readily accepting that. He didn't want to, but because it was His Father's perfect will, He did. So as you're taking communion this morning, take those problems that you have, the thoughts that you have that that you may have brought in here with you this morning, or something that's happened since you've been here. So that's what mine was. Mine happened after I got here. You know, and I know what was like trying to get in this morning. But that hug from Nick changed my day. Mm-hmm. Let the hug of Christ change your life. Mm-hmm. Old Rogue Cross.
God, just thank you, Lord, for loving us, for taking care of us, Father God. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy, for your grace. And God, we just thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, God, to come in and worship you, Father God, through song. Lord, through hearing your word, God, through offering. And I just pray, God, Lord, that you would uh, help us, Lord, as leaders, to be good stewards, Father God, what you're providing. And God, I pray, Lord, your blessings upon this offering, Father. Lord, in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Maybe a phrase. Jennifer said she really wanted us to pray for her because she had a lot of faith for this church. So yeah. it's coming. So that made me feel good. We have a cousin that passed away. Sheila. Yes. Is she? I don't know if she's down there. Her family. Her family. Dear Father, we come to you once again. Dear Father, just to praise your name. Dear Father, just give you the glory and the honor for everything that we have and that you, everything that we are. Dear Father, everything good comes from you. Dear Father, but sometimes bad things in our lives happen. Dear Father, we know that we can always, if we will just turn to you, that, that you will help us through those bad times, whether it's sickness, whether it's death. No matter what the issue, dear 
because we know that we can always wait on you. And your Father, you'll, you'll just reach down and pick us up. Your Father, right now we have a, some names that, that we want to lift up to you, your Father, that, uh, that we know that, that you know for each and every intimate detail of the problem. Your Father, we know that, that, uh, that some things, even though we're bad, your Father, we know that, that you will allow those to happen. Your Father, even in those times, we should say, Blessed is the name of the Lord. You know, just like Job said, Naked I came in the world, and naked I'll go out. But during it all, blessed be the name of the Lord. Your Father, we just, uh, <coughs> we lift up these names to you. Chestnut, Fernandez, Charlie Never, Glenn Smith, your Father, and Jason, Michelle, and the kids, and your Father, as they embark upon a new journey in their life, your Father, we pray that you would just lead and guide them and, uh, and let them see that your will is the perfect will. Your Father, wherever that is, and which is still unknown at this point. Your Father, for Rand Stanford and the Eli Corns family, and the Sheila Disney family, your Father, and her loss, and Betty Bullen and her family, your Father, and another loss in, in that family, and also Brittany Ellis, with your father, we pray that you would lift her up this week, as only you can look. Your father, we just, uh, we pray that, that you will be here with us through the rest of the service, like you have been already. Your father, we pray that everything that we've said and everything we've done up to this point and everything going forward, your father, is, is nothing but glory and honor in you. Pray all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Uh, being uh, PBS uh, kickoff, uh, we'll show a, a, just a few minute video. Um, it's about Phil Robertson. He is speaking. Phil Robertson is the patriarch of the Robertson family. He's the one that began the business, Duck Dynasty and Buck Commander, and, and uh, it's grown into a multi-million dollar business, and the family uh, has remained very faithful, very true to uh, the gospel, to Jesus Christ, to everything. But uh, here's a particular episode um, that he talks about when he was still involved heavily with it. Uh, his son has since taken over, but uh, uh, Watch this video and you'll understand why there's a lot of people who are mad and don't like the Robertson family, but you'll see why there's a lot of people uh, who, who really love what they do and what they stand for. So the phone rings, back when I answered the telephone, <laughs> those days are over. I said, hello, Duck Commander. Guy said, I need to order a duck call. Okay, what do you need? In the process of the guy ordering the duck call. He used God's name in vain about five times just while ordering a duck call. So after about the fifth time, because I loved him, look, I know I'm in California, but I love every last one of you. Now remember something. My love for you is not contingent 
on how you feel about me. If you say, I don't like you, I hate you, I can't stand the sight of you, I don't mind. I love you anyway. Don't forget that. So the guy, about the fifth time he curses God, GD this, CD that, I thought, I said, let me ask you something. Now, I have his name, address, phone number. I said, let me ask you something. Why would you keep using God's name to curse this and that and the other? Why would you do that? I said, he's the only one who can save you from death. Why invoke his name like that? I said, you still there? <laughs> He said, yeah, Hoss, I'm still here. You got my duck call coming? I said, I got it coming. And he went, well, about 10 minutes goes by. The phone rings again. Hello, duck commander. The guy said, hey, it's me again. I said, the question is still on the table. <laughs> Why would you do that? Curse and invoke the creator of the cosmos like that. I said, he can save you from death. You are going to die of something one day, right? He said, yeah, I'm going to die. He said, Mr. Robinson, I've never thought about that. I said, well, don't you think you ought to? I mean, give me a break. I said, you know what you ought to do? He said, what's that? And I looked down at his address. I said, let's see, you be out of Alabama. I said, what you ought to do is just load up and drive over here. I'll tell you a story about the one that you keep using his name to curse people and things. And I said, you may change your mind about it. Just drive over and let's sit down and talk it over. He said, I might do that. I said, you are too. <laughs> <laughs> one week goes by. Knock on the door. I said, come in. This dude steps in, got another guy with him. He said, you know who I am? I said, I don't think I've ever met you. He said, I'm that guy that was using God's name to curse anything and everybody. I said, so you did come. He said, I got a note. I said, come on in here. I told those two fellas what I'm fixing to tell you folks. You know what they did in California? They cried. <laughs> Grown men. And the tears falling on my living room floor. I said, you boys want to go down on the river like they did in the Book of Acts? They said, yes, sir. I took them down there and baptized them. I said, you boys want some dry clothes? I'll throw them in the dryer. We'll dry them for you. They said, we good to go. I said, check you later. They tore off up the road. Seventeen years went by, and Miss Kay said, Phil, you have a speech to give over in Alabama. I had long forgotten those guys. We got over there, and the preacher said, uh, you want to eat a little bite before you speak? And I said, I usually don't eat at these things. He said, well, I got these filet mignons back there. I said, well, good grief, why didn't you tell me that? Yeah, I'll eat. <laughs> So I'm eating, a, I'm eating a steak with the preacher, and some guy comes over and he says, Robinson, do you remember the guy that was cursing and carrying on on the telephone, and you called him on it, and he drove over there and was converted to Jesus? I said, I remember that dude. I said, you know, he was from Alabama. He said, what are you talking about? He's one of the leaders of this church now. He wants to talk to you. Here's a news flash, California. Just one phone call. Just a phone call. You said, why did you quiz him about that? Because I loved him. And I love you. Amen. You don't have to tell me about your sins.
notice there was probably another 25 minutes left on that video. I'd almost rather just go ahead and watch that. <laughs> <laughs> that's the uh, that's the kind of people that developed this program for VBS that we're going to be celebrating and uh, going through this week. I want to offer a special prayer right now for our VBS program. And I want to do it in this way. Would you stay with me? And together, let's, uh, <clears throat> let's ask God to bless the VBS this week. Father, it doesn't matter to me if we have 10 or if we have 110. Father, I pray for VBS this week that everyone, from the student to the teacher, to those who are in the skits, leading the singing, preparing the refreshments, doing the crafts, driving the bus, which we still need bus drivers, Father. I pray that this would be a week that nobody would forget, that your name would be presented to the children. They would hear what it's like to be in Christ and they would never want to change and would want to be in Christ. I pray for the teachers and the volunteers that this would be also a life-changing week for them where they see you move in such a mighty way. And Father, I thank you for Kelly and I thank you for her devotion and her desire for VBS, and I pray for her, and I pray for everybody that is working. God, thank you for people in the church who give up time and who would participate in work in this endeavor. We do not do this to receive the glory for ourselves or to make our church's name great. We do this so your name would be made great, and we would simply be a vessel. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Being July the 6th and 4th was Friday, I usually don't do patriotic messages, um, and uh, I'm not really doing one per se, but I want to use an event in the Bible that took place and uh, to somewhat draw some parallels of that nation and our nation. It's going to be uh, a shorter sermon than normal, but it's going to be direct. I want to set the stage up. If you go to Second Chronicles and you go to chapter 6, you see in Second Chronicles chapter 6, now I've got a different scripture that we'll look at here in a second, but I want to set the stage up. Chapter 6, Solomon recognizes that his dad, David, had prepared everything there was together to build this temple of God. And so he puts together this temple and he gets it ready and he puts... He, 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 gets the best wood, the best gold, the best jewels, all kinds of stuff. He wants to make this great, but he basically says, how can you live in this building when the sky is your home? Okay? And so what takes place and what he does is he prepares the temple. And so in Second Chronicles chapter 6, you see that he has done this. Now I want to read to you a prayer that he prays, and then we'll pick up in chapter 7, starting with uh, verse 1. But I want to I want to read this prayer. Actually, um, it, it's chapter 6. It starts with verse 41. And he has been praying. He's been asking God uh, to fill the place. And in verse 41, he says, Now arise, Lord God, and come to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. May your priests, Lord God, be clothed with salvation. May your faithful people rejoice in your goodness, Lord God. Do not reject your anointed one. Remember the great love you have promised David, your servant. And then we begin. Uh, we begin in the next verse. And, uh, this is just uh, this is incredible. When Solomon. Finished pray. Fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. 
Now here is something I want to show you. The glory of the Lord filled the temple. Fire came down from heaven. I would love one day to have such a prayer <laughs> that fire would come down from heaven. And i got to tell you, I believe this is the kind of fire that Moses stood in front of. Because that fire could have burnt the temple up as soon as it hit. But it didn't scorch a thing. The only thing it did was burn, the, is, is take care of the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And that was amazing. Now, God says a few things, and that's where we're going to pick it up. If you have your scriptures, turn to, um, let, let's start with um, verse 10. And what has happened is, he had this long celebration. He had this seven-day celebration, and then he's sending them home after the celebration, after the worship service for seven days. Verse 10 says, On the 23rd day of the seventh month, he sent the people to their homes, joyful and glad in heart for the good things the Lord has done for David and Solomon and for his people Israel. Why can't we lead church like that each and every Sunday? Why can't we leave filled with joy, filled with praise, glad hearts, because we've been in the presence of the Lord. We have sang to Him this morning. We have sang about Him, to Him. We participated in communion. Well, verse 11. When Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord in the royal place and had succeeded in carrying out all that he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and in his own palace, the Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayers and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. I have chosen this temple. Just because he built it didn't mean God would have chosen it. That, we need to get that understanding. Just sometimes because we do something doesn't mean God is in it. But when we do it with the right heart, with the right mind, and we do it with the favor of the Lord, that He is in it. And that's why He built this temple. Do you know why David was rejected as the builder of the temple? Because he had sinned against God and his heart was not right at one time. And in that moment, and in that sin, God says, you will not build the temple. And then David was heartbroken. He says, but please. He says, God says, well, I'll tell you what. I'll let your son Solomon build it. David says, may I gather all the stuff that is needed for him to build. Wait that step out. And God says, I'll let you gather all the stuff that is needed to build the temple. All the wood, all the stone, all the jewels, all the gold, all the silver, all the rubies. Everything that is needed to build the temple, you may gather. But you're not going to build the temple. So who builds a temple? Solomon. And then God says to Solomon, this is where I will reside. This is where my place will be. And so he says, uh, when he appeared to him and I, he says, I've heard your prayer and I've chosen this place for myself <laughs> as a temple for sacrifices. Now, this next verse doesn't say if, it says when. This word when means that it's going to happen. Why is it going to happen? Because God knows people will, will turn from him. But right now they're not. But God is still talking to Solomon in this dream at nighttime. And this is what he says. Verse 13. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now, my eyes have been open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. As for you, if, not when, huh? now he goes, if, because he knows some people will choose not to. When, it's definite. If, it's maybe. Look what he says. If you walk before me faithfully as David your father did, and you do all that I command and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne as I, uh, as I covenanted with David your father when I said... You shall never fail to have a successor, successor to rule over Israel. 
But if you turn away and forsake the decrees and commands I have given you and go off to serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot Israel from my land which I have given them and will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. I will make it a byword and an object of ridicule among the peoples. This temple will become a heap of rubble. All who pass by will be appalled and say, Why has the Lord done such a thing to this land, to this temple? People will answer, Because they have forsaken the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who brought them out of Egypt, and have embraced other gods and worshiping and, and, worshiping and serving them. That is why he brought all this disaster on them. Make no mistake about what I'm about to say. Make no mistake. This was not a scripture text that would be meant for the United States of America. This was a text, this was a scripture that was meant for the people of Israel. You understand? However, there are similarities and there are things that we can learn as Americans that the Israelites were told by God that they must do. They were taken out of the land of Egypt from slavery. As Americans, we left the country of tyranny and we were able to come and begin this new land. Now, let's take a look at some things. He says, in the very beginning, if my people, which are called by my name. The Israelites were known as God's children, as God's people, as his personal race that he had selected that the Christ would come. He says, if my people, which are called by my name. Now here we see that the Israelites understood what was saying. We are God's children. We've been chosen by him. Look what he says, what he will do. If my people who are called by my name, what will they do? He says, Though I will hear from heaven. Now, when he talks about that he's going to hear from heaven, there's some things that are going to happen before he hears from heaven. Let's look at at least three major things that are going to happen to Israel if they, when they turn from God. Verse 12 or 13 says, When I shut up the heavens so there is no rain. In other words, there's going to be a drought. There's not going to be any rain. How will the crops grow? How will the animals be watered? They live in a desert. He's going to shut up the clouds. He's going to close the doors of heaven. There is going to be a major drought. Anytime, any place suffers a major drought, the economy suffers, everything suffers. And so what he says, I'm going to shut up. Then he says, I'm also going to send locusts to the crops that are already existing, the crops that they have now, so they can still go if the rains are shut off. They can still get their crops, and they can take it into their barns and store it. But what's he going to do? Not only is he going to shut up, but he's going to send locusts to devour the crops of the land. It's going to destroy the existing crops. People are going to be thirsty, and people are going to be hungry. But not only will that happen, simply because they have turned away from God, he is also going to send disease and calamity upon the people. So there's three main things that's going to take place with the Israelites when they turn from God. What are they going to do? What are they going to do? Well, what God is going to do is he's going to shut off the rain, devour the crops, and he's going to send disease to the people. And at some point, when we are our worst 
our sickest, our most broken, when we are at that place where we have exhausted everything, who do we turn to then? We normally turn to God. And it's like the woman who was walking uh, and had this issue of bleeding, and she had gone to the best doctor, seen the best specialist, and she could not stop bleeding. And so Jesus is walking by, and she falls down, and she reaches out and touches the hem of his garment, and immediately she's healed. It seems like when we're at our worst is when we turn to God. And sometimes I think it would be a good habit to turn to God when things are going good. But he says, when everything is bad, when it's at its worst, turn to me. Turn to me, and here's what will happen. He says, verse 14, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Look, here's what happens. He says, first of all, they have to humble themselves. We are not a people of humility. We do not see humility and being humble as an attribute, but God does. God says that they will humble themselves. You know what that means? It's to say, God, I am broken. God, I am in need. God, I, I can't do this. I'm not strong enough. I'm not big enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not spiritual enough. I cannot do morally good enough. I cannot be spiritual enough. So I humble myself before God. It's where we say, God, take me. Use me. So, first of all, if we humble ourselves. Second, he says, if we will pray and seek. If we pray to God and we seek God. There's a lot of people who pray. But there's not as many of those who pray who seek God. We are in the habit of praying to God, especially when things go bad. But are we in the habit of seeking God? Paul said to the Athenians, seek for me, and I'm not far off. We need to seek God. So there's two things right there. They'll humble themselves, they'll pray and seek. And then thirdly, it's repentance. If they will turn from their wicked ways. There are three things that we as Americans can take to this. America, we know, you've heard in your Bible, or you've heard in your school classes, you've, you've learned growing up that this was a Christian nation. Even the majority of the signers of the Declaration of Independence had put their faith in God and understood Him to be the one from whom all blessings flow. We have called ourselves a Christian nation until recently. And so we understand when God says to the Israelites, we can also grasp a few things. He says, if my people, which are called by my name, Christians, not just American Christians, not just European Christians, not just African Christians, if all Christians, that are, how much is that needed here in America? But he says, if my people, Christians, if my people, We're called by my name. Christian simply means little Christ. We are followers of Christ. What do we need to do? The same thing that he called for Israel to do. We need to humble ourselves. God, we have sinned as a nation. God, we have sinned as an individual. God, we have sinned before you. We are not worthy enough. We humble ourselves before God. What else? God, we pray to you and we seek you. As a country, as an individual, God, we, we pray and we seek you. Not our will, not what the government's will is, but what you want for us. 
And thirdly, we repent of our sins. We repent of killing millions of unborn children. We repent of condoning lifestyles that are not in God's will or plan. Whether it be same-sex marriages or whether it would be living with somebody and unmarried. It doesn't matter. If we turn from our wicked ways. You know, Phil was talking about a minute ago about this one man using God's name in vain. Do you know how many people I hear, even those in Christian circles, they may not use GD, but man, they say G all the time. Oh God. And these are people who are called by His name, and they don't say it in respect, worship, and reverence. Oh my God. And that's how they use it. You know, there's one TV show that I respect of one particular actor. And uh, his name is Dual Hill. Dual Hill was, on, was the, the, the black guy on the show Psych. And he made no bones about that he was a Christian. And he would not take God's name in vain on that show, would he, honey? He would not. He would not take God's name in vain. So they rewrote his line instead of saying, oh my God, they rewrote it. So that he would not take God's name in vain. There are so many things, and these are just a few that I say that we need to repent. Parents, teach your children not to text or Facebook OMG. That is no better than just coming outright and saying it. It doesn't matter. He says, if my people who are called my name, they will humble themselves and will pray and seek and turn from their wicked ways. They would repent. Now, what would God do for Israel? This is what God would do for Israel. He, would, he, would, he said this, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and turn from their ways, here's what I'm going to do. I will hear from heaven. He's going to hear you. He's going to hear you. Don't you want God to hear you? I mean, we pray to God all the time, God, hear me in my anguish, hear me with my prayer request, heal me. Hear me because my family is of this or that, I'm sick, whatever. But look, when we turn to Him in repentance and humble ourselves and seek Him, He will hear. And what will He do? I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Look at the order. What's important to God? Healing the land first? No. What's important to God is forgive their sin. We have sin as a nation. We have sin as a people that God is wanting to forgive us first and foremost before any healing takes place. But He just doesn't stop and say, I'm going to forgive you of your sins. He goes further and He says, I'm going to heal your land. The rain that's shut up will cause it to come down. The locusts that have devoured the crops I'm going to send them away. The disease that has afflicted you, I'm going to remove that. I know this is going to sound weird. I'm not so much a tree hugger. I love the environment. I love protecting the land and keeping it clean and not polluting it. But stopping coal cutting down on emissions, protecting the ozone layer, those will never work. You know what will work? You humble yourselves before God. You pray and you seek Him. And you turn from your sinful ways. And we turn from our... It, it can be as a nation or it can be as a, an independent person. As a person we can say, God... I am living in a, an adulterous lifestyle. I turn away from that. God, I am taking your name in vain all the time. I turn away from that. God, I am living a life that's not pleasing to you, and here is what it is. It's, you know, when you go to God and you pray and you seek Him, do you realize that you can be totally upfront and honest with God and say 
verbatim exactly what your struggle with sin is, and there are no threats of lightning bolts to hit you. Now, when we're in public, we, we may say, God, forgive us of our sins. It's good to be specific, but when at least you are home in your closet, in your bedroom, wherever you are, in your car, and you say, God, I lost my temper and I threw out about six or seven curse words before I knew what I was doing. God, I, I committed adultery through lust. Or you be specific, whatever that is. You be specific with God. What's He going to do? He's going to forgive you. As a nation, if we would cry out to God and we would repent specific sins, He's going to forgive us. And He's going to heal our land. You know, there's almost 7 billion people on this planet, and I only know a few, but there's 7 billion people on this planet. And there could actually be 7 more billion added to it, and we still would have room on this planet. But here's the deal. 7 billion people were using up our natural resources. But that's not the problem. That would not be a problem if people would turn. But you know what? People aren't going to turn to Jesus. Some of us will. Here's a very alarming statistic that I heard the other day. Um, I can't remember what, what, where it was I heard it. But here, here's, here's the statistic. I do remember the numbers. 76% of Americans say that they are Christians. 36% of that 76% who say they're Christians go to church. 12% of the 36 that go to church are actively in their jobs, not as ministers, but as people seem to be actively living the lifestyle that a Christian should live. Out of 100%, 76 say they're Christians. Out of the 76, 36% go to church regularly. Out of the 36, 12% seem to be actively following Jesus and searching and seeking the lost. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. Wow. So what will he do? He will forgive their sin and he will heal their land. What else must we do? We kind of discussed this a little bit in our Sunday school class this morning with Mike. There's a couple of other things you need to do. And it's said there in Scripture. First of all, you need to walk faithfully before God and observe his laws and decrees. So he doesn't stop with saying, uh, be humble, pray and seek, and, and turn from your sin. But he goes on and he says... Um, what you need to keep on doing is this. Verse 17. Keep doing this. This is that 12% that keep doing this. Let's make that 12% higher. He says, as for you, if you walk before me faithfully as David your father did and do all that I command and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne as I covenanted with David your father when I said, you shall never fail to have a successor, successor to rule over your land. Look, he said to Israel, if you walk faithfully before me and if you keep my laws, here's what's going to happen. I will establish my throne forever. You know, even in a country where God's throne is not established like it was for Israel, he still establishes his kingdom through his people. And we are his people. We are his kingdom. But so many people who call themselves Christians do not walk faithfully. And he beckons us to walk faithfully and to keep his laws and to keep his decrees. So he says, if you'll do that, I will establish my throne. There's a, 
another part to this. He, he, he says, if you don't, this is what happened to Israel. He says, but if you don't, here's what will happen. Verse 19. Very powerful. This is for Israel. If you turn away and forsake the decrees and commands I have given you, and you go off to serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot Israel. I'll tear them up from the roots. Just like a tree, I will pick that tree up and turn it on its end, and all the roots will be showing. I will uproot East Israel from my land, which I have given them. I will reject this temple that you have built, that is with gold, and with the finest wood and cedar. That this temple that I have consecrated for my name, I will make it a byword and an object of ridicule among the peoples. The temple will be a heap of rubble. And all who pass by will be appalled and say, Why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and to this temple? And the people answer, Because they have forsaken the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who brought them out of Egypt and embraced other gods. Beloved church friends, I personally believe, this is my personal belief, you can have it, you can reject it. I personally believe that God has made us one for nation. And he has established the United States of America as a country. And for many years, we have acknowledged that God Father of this nation. But when, if, when the day comes where we are no longer acknowledging God and living our lives for Him as a country, then the United States of America, even though she's a superpower, I believe one day may be uprooted. Even though we have the best army, best navy, best air force, even though we control the skies, control the seas, who's going to overthrow us? Another country? No, God's just going to loosen His hand of protection on us. And we will destroy ourselves. Rome was one of the greatest armies ever, one of the greatest nations ever, but because she became so sinful, Destroyed herself basically. As the ladies come to the instruments, as we get ready to uh, have a moment of decision, I want to invite each and every one of us, honestly, earnestly, I want us to do this. As a church, and as members of the church, where you are, or if you want to come forward, it doesn't matter. I want to invite you to do three things to humble yourself. To pray and seek Him. And to repent of your sin. It doesn't matter how bad it's been. God is bigger than the worst thing you could ever do. Let's stand and let's say, you have a decision, I'll meet you up front. But I pray that where you are, you would even do those three things.